First off, this morning we have Dr. Greg Turner. He is the CEO of Interaction Consortium, a user-centric web agency in Melbourne and Sydney. And he's also serving on the Code of Conduct Committee of the Django Software That's Foundation. Right. Thank you for that. Thanks, Marcus. He's going to give us a talk about <laughs> Uh, about how digital agencies can invest in open source products without going broke or insane. Thanks, thanks everyone. Uh, today is actually my last day as CEO of the Interaction Consortium. So since the oh, thanks um, since the uh, since the conference program was published, I actually demoted myself uh, to. Head of product and strategy, uh, and we've hired someone far better to, to be the boss of us all. So, if you're interested about who that is and uh, why, then you can uh, find the details uh, on the website. So, at, at PyCon 2010, I gave a talk called Glamkit the Harder, Better, Faster, Stronger Way to Write uh, Reusable Django Code, uh, where I outlined the approach we were taking to open source our CMS for the cultural sector. And it turns out I was largely mistaken in that talk. Uh, so if you saw it, you should come and find me afterwards because I believe I owe you a drink or an apology or both. And um, so instead today, I'd like to tell you about what we're trying to, what we were trying to do, why it didn't work, why, why, the, why the, the approach I described in 2010 was faulty and how the approach we're taking now is working better for us. Um, and so, you know, we've had six years since then to, to, to get it right, and I'd say uh, we're most of the way there. The right things appear to be happening, and uh, we're not broke or insane, uh, but we've got a way to go uh, as well. So what are we trying to do? I want to start from the beginning and talk about why we're in business. Um, uh, there's this quote, a business is a repeatable process that makes money. Um, and I, to me, that's kind of true on the face of it, but it's not really interesting from the from a meaning of life or uh, late stage capitalism point of view. There's there's a bunch of ways to make money, so why would you pick any particular one? And the Interaction Consortium is a web agency that cares deeply about the cultural impact or the, the impact on society of the work that we do. And when we started the IC, we knew that we wanted to pick and choose our clients as much as we could and to be generous to them. We wanted to take on projects with new technical challenges. We wanted to build sites that made the world a better place. But as you can imagine with these ideals, we're not really chasing the money. Uh, in order to make that kind of thing work, we had to kind of believe in what we're doing, even if the money, you know, didn't work out. And also we had to be really good at it uh, so that hopefully it did work out. And, and the money would arrive more or less as a side effect of, um, of the things we were trying to do. So I want to tweak what Paul Freit said uh, in not a terribly original way, but to say for, for us, a business is a repeatable process that retains value. And instead of focusing on money, uh, a business generates new value, shares some of that value with the world, and keeps some of it as well. And so the value could be money, thing, you know, financial things, but it might be knowledge, or it might be code, or it might be something different, fun, and exciting. And so the business needs to generate value in a repeatable way. So that could be many things, um, process optimization, figuring out your business model. But for the purposes of this talk and this conference, um, uh, I want to focus on reusing our code uh, in a way that generates additional value every time we use it. So it's trying to pick the right flavor of thing to um, hang our hook on, hang our hat on. Value is also a, a, a more useful concept, I think, than money to apply to open source software, although Russ's recent comments notwithstanding. So I'm going to use Glamkit as an example. Glamkit, by the way, is our open source CMS for the cultural sector. Um, Glam stands for galleries, libraries, archives, and museums, and it's used by institutions. Uh, like the Art Gallery of New South Wales and MCA Australia and SF MoMA in San Francisco. And it's designed more or less for any organization uh, who lets the public in through their doors. And so it's built on Django Python, uh, sorry, Python Django, Fluent CMS, which is what we use for kind of dealing with rich content. That's a talk for another day. Um, 
and uh, IceKit, which is our kind of internal tools for building websites. And then we've put the kind of museum culture specific stuff around the outside. And then we wrap it all up in a, in a Docker container for deployment and scalability, which I'll come back to in a moment. So we spent many woman months, many hundreds of thousands of dollars creating GlamKit and imbuing it with our experience and our expertise. And so it's, this is, it's kind of this incredibly valuable artifact, the code base. And we know museums want and attach a lot of value to those things, and some of them at least are willing to pay for it. So the question is, why did we decide to open source it? Last year in Brisbane, Russ Keith McGee, hi Russ, uh, <laughs> gave a great talk on how to get money moving around the open source ecosystem and touched upon it again uh, just now so that developers are paid for the time that they spend on open source projects. So there's Russ channeling uh, Donald Trump there. If you. So, <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Uh, that's actual size, yeah. Uh, so you should go and watch that talk. Uh, uh, like a Donald Trump speech, it contains several ideas that maybe sound appealing but don't work for one reason or another. Uh, unlike Donald Trump, Russ admits this and uh, adds <laughs> a really interesting new idea that I think uh, really could work and I think still needs to happen, which is uh, turning Pipey into a kind of subscription micropayment distribution uh, platform. As a web agency, uh, we're coming at the same problem, but from the opposite end, where it's not a problem of money, where the, prob the money's not the problem. People are paying us to write code for them. Um, we don't have an intrinsic lack of money to pay developers, solve problems, write code. The challenge is whether we can successfully bring about a situation where that problem solving and code writing happens in an open source environment. So in other words, for a business that needs to retain value somewhere, the open source dilemma is, can I retain enough and ideally more value by open sourcing my software than by keeping it closed? If, you wanna, if, you, if you're feeling hungry or whatever, or feeling a bit hungover, you can skip to the end of this talk because the answer is yes, right? Um, here's why. Uh, I think software increases its value when you open source it. So it it becomes more valuable to more people. It feels fairly simple um, assertion. The, the trick for an agency is to make it more valuable to you at the same time. And you can do this on the condition, I think, that your business model doesn't rely on license fees. So to me, the sign of a good business model is the fault tolerance. And so that if some, you have f at least four or five backup plans or competitive advantages uh, if, if the environment or the world changes. If you're only relying on limiting access to your code through license fees for success, then your business model is, I think, not very fault tolerant. The, the lack of license fee profit for us would be more than made up for by the increase in market size and momentum uh, that builds around an open source product. Um, the, the cultural sector is increasingly uh, moving towards free and open source software. And so every signal we get tells us that we'll get more clients with GlamKit open and closed. And in fact, Museums are beginning to insist on it. Here's a section from a client agreement that we signed last year. Uh, the key points are you will open source all the code, and if you don't, you'll pay us money. And, uh, you know, I, I, I was kind of undenied about signing up to pay money, but I was like, yeah, I, you know, of course we're going to do this. We believe in it. Why wouldn't I commit to doing this? And, you know, if you don't think you or your company will find time to open source, sign a contract like this because it's incredibly motivating. <laughs> um, there's another cost, which is that by open sourcing, we're signing ourselves up to maintain the software. So what is, what if, sorry, the maintenance burden of GlamKit exceeds the time that we have to do it once it's open source? So there are at least two approaches we'd take as a company to, to, to tackle that problem. One is we're a web agency, we connect developers with money, and we're in a position to compensate people for working on the project. Um, so, and given that we're already going to be maintaining something that we invest in, you know, it doesn't matter whether it happens here or here. The second and um, kind of more powerful thing is that communities are scaling opportunities. So if GlamKit starts being seen as something like WordPress for museums and starts getting that kind of 
um, ecosystem around it, then more people are going to show up with more resources to contribute. That's you know the, the hope of every uh, open source project. So in that situation, the demand on our time is going to be quite high, but spending that time not writing code and, and uh, closing tickets as much as um, helping others in the community and helping people get involved and on board uh, and understanding the path we're on is much more effective than, than, than doing the work on our own. So we might not get paid for any of that. We might not get paid as an agency to help other people maintain and improve GlamKit. But even in the worst case, we'll, we, we're in a position where we can um, share in the resulting value. And the third reason why we might be reluctant to open source is, isn't directly to do with money. It's because it's kind of embarrassing. It's, there's, a, there's a moment of vulnerability as a web agency. And that's because if you look at the, the motivational landscape for, for a traditional web agency model, there isn't a lot motivating us to write good quality code, I'm ashamed to admit. If you have to hit a deadline or a budget, then a quick solution is, this is a good solution. If you're creating stuff that is only going to be used by one client, whatever works for that client is fine. If you're paid by the hour, there's a motivation to kind of get the numbers up for uh, the more you can build, the better. So that leaves developers with like very, it, it kind of puts developers in a, in a, in a very um, difficult uh, motivational landscape. They're left with uh, intrinsic motivation to write good code. If you're a developer who cares about her art, then writing good code is just the right thing to do. But in a traditional web agency, all of those factors are against you. And this all changes once you start reusing code. So obviously, when you reuse code, it helps maximize the chance of delivering on time and within budget, and the whole kind of risk goes down. And by the way, if you're wondering why your web agency can't hang on to developers or deliver projects on time and within budget, the chances are is because you're not reusing your code enough. You should, con you should constrain your market in that case uh, so that you're only working for clients where you have a chance to reuse your code. And if you have clients who, who, where that doesn't work and they want something done differently to everyone else, then uh, I think you should either fire them or rebuild the investment time into your pricing uh, so that you're offsetting the cost of doing that work. So even if you're billing by the hour, it's not like clients will want to use you less if you're working faster or more efficiently by reusing code. So instead, by delivering the same work in fewer hours, your work becomes more valuable. And because we're retaining value as a business, we get to keep more of that value. And so, of course, if you're reusing code, then you want it to be as good quality as possible. And uh, I don't think I need to justify very strongly that open sourcing uh, is a uh, is a great way to improve the engineering quality of your code. So I think that vulnerability, the moment of in the moment of open sourcing, is worth it for for a web agency. Glamkit, for example, is in a pretty good place, but it's not perfect. Uh, and rather than being embarrassed by the imperfection, I, I'd, I'd rather we use it as an opportunity to learn and share knowledge and and uh, improve, um, which is. Uh, I guess, the open source way. And so more than that, by being, in pub being, being vulnerable in public, you're demonstrating your kind of belief that what you're doing is, is the right thing to do, which brings me to this, that open sourcing your software is an act of leadership. So it's easier to convince people to adopt open standards than closed standards. But, but more than that, it's a statement that you believe so much in the idea and you're so clearly at the forefront of what you're doing that you're not worried about competitors stealing your ideas or creating barriers to entry so you can make money from doing that. The most important thing is that the idea is shared by the community and takes root within that community. So I'm coming to, to why I was wrong in 2010. I, I said in that talk that that our cultural sector clients all have similar but uniquely different needs, which is true. Uh, and the conclusion I reached was that therefore we needed to ab abstract out the common functionality from our clients, from the, uh, from the CMS, so that when we start our projects, we're turning things on rather than fighting against the kind of pre-built one size fits all kind of CMS approach. So for example, every museum has events. Uh, 
of some kinds, and they all have different f shapes and flavors uh, to each other. And I, I thought GlamKit shouldn't enforce any decisions apart from specifying that an event has a time and a place and maybe a name. And what we're trying to guard against in 2010 was the kind of frustration you get with with a, a particularly complex Drupal or WordPress project where you're installing modules and they nearly do what you want, but not quite. And uh, you want it not to do this one little thing. And the next thing you know, you're drowning in a mess of spaghetti code. And I, I think on reflection, spaghetti, that kind of situation, the spaghetti code is less a consequence of anything architectural about a general purpose CMS, but more, it's more of a question of project, uh, product match to market. So WordPress and Drupal aren't particularly designed for museums. So they're not a great fit for a complex museum website without a lot of in plugin installation and customization. So WordPress out and Drupal out of the box, they don't care about events or collections or sponsors or where the cafe is. Um, and GlamKid in 2010, got around this problem by caring about everything that a museum cared about, but not actually doing anything about it. So it, it, it provided these kind of latent possibilities in, in the form of abstract mix-ins, but, uh, and you ended up with really clean and elegant and well-architected code, but debugging was complex, the code base was complex, it took a pretty long time to get there. It wasn't compellingly uh, um, quicker uh, or easier than starting from scratch unless you worked at the IC and you're interested in sharing the code um, amongst your projects. I get all my notes, yeah. So here's what we're doing instead. Firstly, we've been around the block uh, a bunch of times since 2010. We've got a really good idea of uh, what works in a museum website and what doesn't. And we've seen that if you start from working software uh, that uh, is a museum website and it's designed to be hacked on, then it's a much lower barrier to entry than starting uh, from a bunch of really good mix-ins that, uh, that are turned off. So these days, GlamKit's super opinionated but open to negotiation. So there are layers of opinionation, opinionatedness. <laughs> uh, so for example, basic content tools are must-haves. Uh, events come as a hackable uh, kind of proof of concept app, a pattern. Um, and collections, museum collections are opt-in abstract patterns because they really differ. Um, Third-party integrations at this stage, we're just saying it was mostly BYO. We've got a couple of things that we've done that we're sharing. Um, sorry, I keep, yeah. Um, we're wrapping all of that up uh, this, this is something we did this year. We're wrapping all of that up in a stack of uh, Docker containers for Django, uh, Postgres, and uh, yeah, sorry, Django. There is a Postgres one in there somewhere. Elastic and Redis, and uh, we're sharing those as well. I think the Postgres one is the plain vanilla Postgres image. Um, and so this might be an, an unusual stance to take. Like it's normal for um, for. A, what we've been doing up until then is just releasing the thing where we're um, we're making the change. Um, so, so why are we releasing the whole stack as, as in this kind of open source product? Um, why don't we focus on just what we do differently? Well, going back to what I was saying about open sourcing being an act of leadership, if you make this gesture of leadership and, and belief in the potential of what you're doing, you can show people that the idea works then people become willing to change their process or thinking uh, to fit in with, your, with, with what you're asking them to do. But then the, the challenge becomes less about the idea and more about the, the pragmatics, all of the other decisions that get in the way of being able to install a, um, a Python CMS. So remember, our competition is WordPress and Drupal. Like museums have this kind of big attraction towards uh, low barrier to entry, um, general purpose CMSs. And they've commoditized hosting, they've, they've, they've made it really easy to, uh, to get up and running. So someone might I, uh, really like the idea of GlamKit, but coming from that WordPress world, if you ask them to in pip install Django and, in, and set up Nginx and Postgres and Redis and Elastic before you can even uh, uh, get started, then you've lost them. So we're, we're sharing our knowledge as a web agency who builds websites all day, every day. This is how we do things. If, if you're a museum who's got one site and really doesn't 
want to reinvent the kind of question of how you're going to host your museum website, you could just do this. Uh, it takes three lines to get GlamKit running on Docker, by the way. I think we can get it down to two. Um, one of those lines downloads a script and runs it, but um, uh, having that kind of consistent full stack will save us a whole bunch of support time and um, kind of platform specific problem shooting. Now, I've said a lot about how uh, an agency can approach open sourcing its core product in a way that allows uh, the agency to retain some value from that in a repeatable way, uh, and how they might grow a, a kind of um, resourced and vibrant community around it. So that hopefully covers how we might avoid going broke <laughs> and take care of that side of things. But I haven't said much yet about how not to go insane. Uh, largely because I don't have all the answers here, but I want to share a couple of things that I found helpful. Um, firstly, there's a, there's a whole conference about mental health and open source communities. So the, the, the OS Feels conference is called. They just had their 2016 session, uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing the videos from that. But in 2015, uh, Jacob Kaplan Moss from the DSF had a, um, a, a, a really powerful talk about burnout and his relationship with the open source community. Um, and burnout, as Russ was saying, is endemic in our community. Here he is again. Uh, some of you may remember that in PyCon 2016, uh, in Melbourne, I think it was, uh, Russ gave a keynote where he, <laughs> where he briefly covered the, the connection, that connection between the funding model of open source and the mental health issues caused by not having any money and having a whole bunch of pressures on your time. Um, that's made this section a whole lot shorter, so I'm actually going to finish early. Uh, thanks, Russ. Uh, I tried to get a photo of the Trump hand gesture, but uh, uh, I, th I, th I, think the, I think the slide covers it this time. Um, the most useful thing I think I have to add from, from a web agency perspective is don't go it alone. Uh, I think it's risky uh, to your mental health if you're open sourcing code as an unsupported individual. Um, <laughs> There are companies who rely on and build upon open source projects. Some of them fund it. Some of them are the criminally negligent ones that Russ was referring to. And you probably know companies in both of those um, uh, categories and, and, and many, many places in between. So I would suggest, I mean, I, maybe it's practical, maybe it's not. If you're thinking of open sourcing a project, um, maybe consider approaching one of these companies uh, and ask them to, to, to patronize the project, to kind of um, uh, become a caretaker of the project for you uh, so that uh, they have your back. And I don't know what that looks like. Maybe it's um, you know, some resourcing, some guarantees, but at least the, the company has put its public name to the public code and has a, by doing so, uh, has a vested interest in making sure it you know, lives and grows and uh, is generally healthy. The kinds of um, sums that are meaningful uh, in terms of ensuring longevity of an open source project and the health of open source ecosystems, much easier for companies to find than individuals. And I think companies, not individuals, should be bearing the burden of uh, looking after the things that the companies are, uh, are um, benefiting from. And third talk I'm citing from Russ. <laughs> uh, the, the, uh, there's a talk from last year called I Am A Doctor, but uh, where, where he goes, uh, where he covers uh, more resources for, for preventing and treating mental health issues uh, in, in open source communities. Um, so uh, that's a, a, an, an, another great reference. And um, uh, there's some really good tools in there for, for um, to have in your in your arsenal, just in case. Um, here's a summary list of uh, some things you can do to avoid burnout. Um, the main thing I want to say, though, is uh, to take care of yourselves. Um, uh, it's important to keep out an eye out for the signs of burnout. They, they creep up, and uh, one of them is the denial that anything is wrong. So um, uh, notice that within yourself and give yourself tools for dealing with burnout 
practice them before you start burning out. Um, so for example, make sure you step away from the computer and the phone and screens, uh, get to exercise, be home in time for dinner with your loved ones and, uh, and don't go it alone. Open sourcing software is a vulnerable act, but it's also, I think, a strong and generous act to bring your idea of a better way of doing things into the world, and that's its own reward. But in the end, that's not the reason why we open source, not to make money, not to become famous, but because you can't not open source your code. It's the right thing to do for your fellow humans on this planet. And every so often, I have mini panic attacks about all of the little things that still remain to be done in Glamkit uh, and uh, all of the you know, complexity that's going on there and the different uh, people pulling in different directions. Uh, there's big things on the horizon. There's things that are standing in our way. Uh, and more and more of that is happening in public now. And when that happens, I take three deep breaths and uh, feel the air flowing through my, my nose and my, into my chest. And I remember how far we've already come over the last six years. I look around at all of the amazing people who've contributed, um, believed in what we're doing. And I look at the horizon and... Remember how a hill, you know, always looks steeper than it really is, and it always looks further away than it really is. And um, sometimes, you know, that brings the energy and the focus that I need, and, uh, and I can keep moving. And then sometimes I need to take a rest. And so good things are happening, and uh, it's important not to forget that whatever happens, it's what you make of it that matters. So uh, take care of yourselves and uh, each other. Thanks. Thank you, Greg. I guess you take questions. Mm -hmm. If we yeah, have sure. a couple of minutes, please remember that the question starts with words like how, what. <laughs> Tell me more about my Trump hands. <laughs> um, uh, uh, you uh, made, a, made an argument at the beginning about um, structuring contracts to force you to uh, uh, give back as open source and whatnot. There is a world of difference, though, between um, just open sourcing it, slapping a BSD license on it and open sourcing it, and it actually being a project that it's in a position to be actively contributed to. So how do you make the economic or business argument to spend the extra engineering time to make it a project that other people can actively contribute to? It's an excellent question to deal with with a hangover. Um, <laughs> uh, you're you're absolutely right. Yeah, there's there there are um, there's you know hitting the the red button in GitHub that says make the code public, and there's the you know all of the other stuff like that's the free thing. Um, so yes, we can tick that box quite easily on the contract, but. Um, uh, I, I kind of think you have to be coming at it from a from a um, uh, existing pre-existing belief in the power and potential of open source software. So um, there, there has been uh, times in our history where we've gone, yes, we're using open source software, and sometimes that's meant Django, or sometimes it's meant you know the thing that we look after and and um, and uh, um, take care of. Uh, so, this might be a long way of saying I don't have an easy answer. One, there are a few things we do. I've noticed, we noticed uh, a few months ago that our GitHub account was basically a kind of mess. It was, it was things we've open sourced and things that we've forked and th you know, things that we've abandoned and things that we haven't just started. And, and um, so then we, uh, Ty Lee, our, our tech lead, and I sat down and we, we we, we thought, okay, we'll make a new GitHub space and everything that goes in this GitHub space, we put our weight behind. So it's a small list of uh, things we care very, very much about. Um, and those are the things that com comprise Ice Kit, Glam Kit. Um, and uh, so we've made a safe space for it, uh, a, a garden, I guess, walled garden. Um, from the client point of view, um, 
Uh, what, what I didn't show you in that contract is that they're also insisting that they have to be using the same code as our other clients already use. So, um, uh, and they know there's a, some background information basically, but which is that those clients are also already um, uh, invested in open sourcing their things and sharing it with other people in the museum community. So, so we. We're under this kind of moral pressure to do uh, open sourcing properly, and to, we we know we won't get away with just hitting the button. Um, very difficult to for me to be made, any more clear than that. I think at this point, but I'll have a think and write things up. Oh, how are we going? Um, unfortunately, we are out of out of time. Thanks, everyone. Thank you again for, for this talk. Thanks, Marcus. <laughs>